Good morning, everyone. Sure is good to see you all this morning. I want to especially welcome everyone, uh, especially our first-time folks. We want to welcome you uh, here at Valley Harvest. Uh, it's been a big week for us, and uh, we're just looking forward to what God's going to do this morning. I, I'm believing that God's going to speak to our hearts today in a special way. And um, some of you are here today because, uh, you know, you got the message that there was going to be something out of the ordinary said, and there he is. Uh, I want to kind of set it up for you before we get into, I'm going to preach from the scripture, the word, as always, uh, that's something a pastor has to do. Uh, but I want to just kind of set it up a little bit and and help you guys to know where I'm coming from. As your pastor now for, oh, 29 years, I've always had this mindset about my role. Uh, a pastor is a visionary leader. And my primary responsibilities are a little different from what a lot of Christian people think a pastor does. I get it all the time from talking to people. I'm constantly, you know, when I'm talking to people in the world, I've kind of quit trying to help people relate to what pastors do because they all think that we work a day and a half a week. They think that we mainly eat chicken and talk a little bit and, and you know, that kind of thing. So uh, you can't. You can't, you can't help them till they get a revelation and some understanding. But you know what I've come to understand that over all these years, even church members often don't really relate to the role of a pastor. They think they do because you only get to see, you get to see the icing on the cake, hopefully. Hopefully that's what you get to see is the icing on the cake. Uh, my role is so, so full, but I always say my favorite thing is preparing to preach and preaching. That's the icing on the cake. The rest of it is just work and fulfilling other duties. So my main job is to hear from God. Now, that's everybody's job, by the way. I'm praying, I'm praying that you guys are going to hear from God today. But as a pastor, my primary responsibility is to hear from God and then share with the people what I have heard from God. Another part of my role is to keep my finger on the pulse of the church. Now, I don't know if you all try to do that or not, but that's pretty varied as well. Um, but then another part of my job is to be a leader. I have never forgotten what Edmund Kirtner said to me when I came here to interview with the current leadership team. He said, we have been praying that God would send us a leader. And I believe if we can see God in what you are proposing, you'll find that we'll follow. And that's been true of this congregation. Another job of a pastor is to identify trends. Not so much trends in the world, but trends in the church. To, to identify trends and to develop strategies and to lead effectively. So, with that understanding, let me just, I hope that will help you follow what I'm getting to right now. I'm thankful that we got good turnout this morning. Last Sunday, we had the lowest attendance we've had in, I don't know how many years. There was 132 people here last year, uh, last, last week, 132 in our morning service. 
Um, I said, we're trying to identify a trend. During those 29 years that I've been your pastor, there was a, there was a while that we were knocking on 300th door on Sunday morning. In two, two ser- took two services to get everybody in. And we had around 300 people. So I'm getting, as a pastor, feeling my responsibility heavily. I'm asking you as this congregation to get real about church. That 132 last week, we can make all the excuses we want to make. Everything from COVID, oh, well, you know, people just haven't gotten back after COVID. Baloney, they're going everywhere else. Football stadium's full. We can say, oh, pastor, it's just the times we're in. Boy, if we're going to use that excuse, that, that, we got that backwards. Because the times we're in, the church house ought to be full. Amen? So, we can blame it on every, whatever we want to, to, to blame it on. But it boils down to, here's what we can do. We can point fingers at somebody, or we can lend a hand, one or the other. Now, Ephesians says that God has given the five-fold ministry to build up the church, to edify the saints, for the work of ministry. How many of you know that the work of ministry is to be done by the body of Christ? Now tradition says the pastor is supposed to do all that because that's what he gets paid for. But the short of it is we're all called. We're all called. If we're saved, we're all called to do the work of the church. And so... The message today is going to be about that. I want to let you know, as a pastor leader that feels his responsibility heavily every day. I said earlier that a pastor's job is to hear from God. I hope you know that a Christian's job is to hear from God. If you get up every day and you don't think that it is imperative that you hear from God today. You need to rethink that one. Because we walk by faith. And we walk by the spirit. And that's something that has to happen every single day. So as I was saying as your pastor. You all know that every Thursday I go to Piedmont. If I'm around here. And I seek God for what he wants me to come and say to you on Sunday. Last week, like I do a couple of times a year, I was away. I left after church last Sunday. Some of you may have noticed I didn't run to the foyer where I usually do to shake your hand and talk to you a little bit. I went out that door right there and got in my truck and took off, and I was there until Friday. But I went to seek God, to ask God for some direction, to bring to his church and that's what today's message is all about so for the reading of God's word I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet we're going to honor God's word written in Matthew chapter 4 beginning with verse 17 and it says From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, 
and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway, they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your plan for your church. Thank you for the opportunity today for us to be together and to share your heart and to share hearts. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts today and that you would bring us into the place that you are calling us to. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. And you can be seated. I'm going to talk to you today about being fishers of men. Fishers of men. Jesus, we, we read the story of one of the first uh, occasions where Jesus is coming into his earthly ministry and beginning to preach the gospel. The message that Jesus had and the message of the gospel still today is very simple. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you realize that the hope of this whole world is in that gospel message? The hope of this entire world. Have you noticed that the world we live in is pretty hopeless? People are hopeless. But what the world needs is Jesus. And the church has been trusted. The Lord has trusted his church. That's us. That's not just me. That's not just the fivefold ministry. That's not just the Appalachian Conference. He has trusted us with the ur urgent message. But not just did he trust us with that message, he gave us a charge to proclaim it. No other institution on the face of the earth has the mission and the mandate and the charge to proclaim the message of the gospel except the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's us. And so there's a couple of things that we need to consider this morning. The first thing that, that I want the Lord to drive home in all of us is that as a believer, as a Christian, we, every one of us, are in ministry. Not just the people that stand behind the pulpit. Not just the people that, that sing or uh, Exhort, every one of us has a ministry. And Jesus modeled it for us. The, the story that we read showed that he stepped into that ministry one day. I want to ask you a question, a very serious question. Have you stepped into your ministry yet? As a born again child of God, called out of darkness into the light of the gospel. 
Have you stepped into your ministry yet? You see, one of the biggest mistakes and one of the greatest burdens I have as a pastor is that so often I see Christian people that seem to have the mindset, well, Pastor, what are you preaching so hard for? What are you trying to get us to do? We got saved. We, we know we, our lamb, we're in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, we know we're going to heaven. We've done heard that a dozen times. Sometimes I preached the message last Sunday on salvation. Just the way to get saved. But you know what? I saw some heavy-eyed, sleepy-headed people in here last week. You know why? It's like, oh, man, we got to hear that again. We done heard that. Don't even know I've been saved for 50 years. Been a member of this church. That message better not get old to you. That message better not get to the place that there's not something that still stirs in your heart when it's proclaimed. Yes. We've got to understand, people of God, we are all called to be Jesus' disciple. What does a disciple do? A disciple is one that follows. A disciple is one that learns. A disciple is one that, watch this, does. Follows, learns, and does. Even in the world out here. In businesses these days, people recognize the value of mentoring. Everywhere I go, you know this world is run by people in training. Everywhere I go, there, there's somebody shadowing somebody else in the hopes that one day, you know, you're going to get it and you're going to run with it. Some of you businessmen in here, you know that model because you, you're working it. It, it that, but that's the way Jesus set it up. As we grow up, as we grow up in our walk with God, one of the marks of us growing up is to learn that one day, it's not just all about us getting to heaven. It's about us taking as many people with us to heaven as we possibly can. Amen? Amen. So in short, ministry and discipleship results in duplication and expansion for the Christian I believe it's all about a mindset there really has to be a point someday that it just kind of you get the revelation of who you are in Christ you are a child of God you are his disciple he has called you and anointed you for this purpose. Jesus said that we would do the works that he did and greater works than these. I wonder, have you, have you ever allowed yourself to really think about that? Most of us hear that statement and say, oh, I, I could never do the stuff that Jesus did. And when you say, when you think about the fact he said, you'll do those and greater, we automatically think, well, he didn't mean that. I wonder, when, when, when you hear this word that Jesus said, you will do the works that I have done, does that challenge you a little bit? Do you take that to heart? So brothers and sisters, here's the, here's, the, here's the thing that God wants me to communicate to this body today. Every one of us that are saved today are ministers. Why don't you look up the word minister? I don't mean, here's all it means. It means a servant. I want you to just forget about the image that the world has and embrace what Jesus said about it. 
Matthew 28, he told us to go and teach all nations and make disciples. That's what he said. In Matthew 5, he said, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he said, you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him that called you out of darkness and into light. Acts 1.8, he said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Man, I'm going to tell you, every one of us ought to be honored today that God said you're my witnesses every one of us has a calling every one of us has a gifting and a ministry and I must charge you today have you entered into yours yet have you decided that there's more to it than just being saved God's called me to do something have you accepted that vision and that anointing Now, I know that everybody tries to dodge it for a while. Moses said, Lord, you got the wrong guy. I can't talk. Gideon said, Lord, why are you calling me? I'm the least one in my tribe. Jonah took off in the opposite direction and went just as far as he could go. And I'm going to be honest with you. I ran from it for a long time myself. But here's what God said about it. He said, the gifts and the callings are without repentance. In other words, he's not, he's not going to change his mind about it. This is something that he has called us to do. You can run, but you can't hide. God, is he don't need to change his plan. We just need to get with his plan. And that's where I'm here to challenge us today is to get with the plan. Would you stay with me and let me further, uh, further amplify this? The second thing, the first thing was Jesus entered his ministry. It's time for us to enter in ours. Second one is we're going to talk today about real people in ministry. And that's, I started to say me and you, but I really want you to see it's about you. It's about real people in ministry. Who did Jesus call the first thing when he went in ministry? Where did he see the greatest potential to reach the lost? He called some fishermen. He didn't go get somebody with a college degree he didn't go get somebody that had been to bible school he didn't go get the pharisees he went down and found some old rough smelly fishermen these guys were commercial fishermen Can you think of anybody that you or the world might think would be less likely to be used of God than that? I can't. From all we know about Peter, he was just about as rough around the edges as anybody you could find. But Jesus targeted him and called him he said I want I want you to be my witness just come on follow me Peter you leave your boat leave your net come on I'm gonna I'm gonna make you a fisher of men do you realize where the most effective ministry in this world takes place we all want to think right here oh I love it I love it when Ministry takes place right here. But I'm going to tell you where where the most effective ministry takes place. It's among real people relating to real situations and bringing the word of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit into the place that people live. 
Now, I told you a while ago, I'm, I, I'm, on, I, I'm trying to help y'all see that I really can relate to where you are, and I'm also trying to help you to relate to where I am. If you think that your excuse not to be a witness is that you're not a preacher, I get that sometimes. Sometimes people, I don't even, I don't like to use this term, but y'all know what I mean. This is a, this is a traditional big church term. That's why I don't use it. But they, a, lot of, a lot of pastors would refer to you as lay people. I don't even like to hear that. But, but what, what I hear sometimes people say, it, their excuse for why I'm not witnessing, well, I'm not a preacher. I ain't called to be a preacher. Well, if you think that's a good excuse, you ought to see the reaction you get in this world when people find out you're a preacher. Everybody in here has far less ice to break to be a witness than I do. I'm going to tell you what, sometimes people look at me funny when I say this, but I'm being as honest as I can be today. When I'm meeting people out here in the world, when I'm hanging out, when I target somebody to say, man, I'm going to try to witness, that guy needs Jesus, I'm going to try to get a witness. And you know what I do? I keep it undercover just as long as I can that I'm a pastor. I want them to think, man, this guy, you know, he knows something about cars. He knows something about building. He knows something about plumbing. He knows something about hard work. Look at him. He's dirty. Man, when I, y'all might see me sometime in a restaurant around here. Sometimes if I'm working, I just go in dirty as I can go. Just, I ain't going to change clothes. I'm a working man. I want people to know I can relate. On, a, on the trip this week, y'all won't find this hard to believe. Two things you won't find hard to believe. Number one, I stopped at a DQ to get a twist cone. Number two, there was an old boy there that just seemed like he needed some talking to and so I struck up a conversation, delayed the trip for a little bit, but I struck up a conversation, and man, we were talking up a storm. And finally, he asked me what I did. I said, I'm a pastor. I want to show you what he did. We'd been talking for a while, and, and he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He said, oh. I declare as I live and breathe. That's what he said. He said, oh. After a while, we was talking about our kids, and, and, and he asked me about my kids. I said, my daughter, she, we have a Christian school. My daughter uh, works in the Christian school. He went, oh. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, preachers have a barrier to overcome in reaching people that most of you do not have. They think we're professionals at it. They think we have a, uh, some kind of a little script that we use. They think that we're all about, you know, a lot of people in the world tell you this, and preachers, all they want you money. <laughs> they think we don't really work. We don't know nothing about work. Of all, shoot, all we do is eat chicken and, and get up and talk about an hour and get paid good for it. Yeah. They think we're all about to hit them with some religious pitch that they've heard many times. You don't have to overcome that stuff. You see, in, you are in real life situations with them and it should be an open door for you to relate to. Am I encouraging you today? Am I helping you today? Praise the Lord, a couple of you. I want to get the rest of you on board. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Accept your calling, but be real. I've got a friend today, a lifelong friend, that was an alcoholic when I was his friend. 
but he's been saved and faithfully serving Jesus for a long time now, probably 30 or more years. And almost every time we talk, he makes this comment to me. He said, man, you was just real to me all the time. When I was drinking, you was real. When I was, wasn't acting right, you was just Steve. And he said, I saw that. And he said, I saw more than that. You know, there came a, pl- there came a time when I was able to lead my friend to the Lord. And he blesses me every time I talk to him of how God is still moving in his life. But we got to be real with people. That's, that's all Jesus called us to do. Be real. We've got to show people that we recognize their value and that we love them right where they are. People, people want to talk. They need direction. They need somebody that they can, they can feel deep inside. It, it's okay for me to be transparent with this person. To be effective as a witness. Other than being saved, all you got to do is be real. All right, so some of you still need some more encouragement. I'm going to point this out to you. Don't worry about, don't, if you feel like you're unqualified to be a witness for Jesus, don't let that stop you. Because he didn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He does not call the qualified. You got, we got to understand, this thing don't run like the world does. If you think you're the least likely to be used of God, you're right the one he wants. If you think you're the least able, you're right the one he's looking for. Listen, I want you to notice that Jesus told Peter and Andrew. He said, follow me. What else did he say? What did he say? I will make you fishers. I know you're not a fisher of men right now. I know you're not an effective, but if you'll follow me, I'll make you one. If you will follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. That's what he said. Do you realize that apart from being saved, there's probably not anything more urgent with the Lord on his heart about you than it is to make you his witness? I will make you a fisher of men. The question is, and here's here's a rubber meat to road thing for a lot of Christians. Do you really want to be his witness? Do you really feel like what Pastor Perry said a while ago? You don't know what God's done for me. You can't tell nobody what God's done for me like I can tell it. Do you really feel that? Do you really? Is that part of your desire is to really be a witness for Jesus? I will promise you that he wants to develop you. I I stopped right there just to let that settle a little bit. Hey, we all need some developing. When me and Sheila were in Georgia at Emmanuel College, we got married in my second year of college. Most of you know this story. Went to school part-time and worked part-time and had some lean years that God provided. But there was a a big grocery store in the uh, little town there called Dill's Food City. The man owned, I don't know how many grocery stores he had, but they were large grocery stores. It, it, was, it was privately owned, but it was like a chain. 
But I went to see Mr. Dilworth to see about getting me a part-time job. And I got an interview with him. And I went in there and, you know, we were walking around the store talking about it. And he was asking me questions of this and that and the other. And he said, we got to this. He said, have you ever worked in a grocery store before? And I said, no, sir. I thought, man, he's looking for somebody with experience. He, it's probably the end of this interview. You know what he said? He said, good. He said, I, I'd, I'd rather train you the way I want it done. Hey, you know, he said, I, I'm glad you hadn't had any experience. He said, I'm, I'm going to teach you how I want you to do it here. And he put me to work. That's the way Jesus is. All your preconceived notions about what it's going to take for you to be an effective witness for Jesus, will you just let him make you a fisher of men? time but um, but I used to had a real good friend in Ohio that spent a lot of time fishing with him and I didn't know anything didn't have anything to work with and he had a boat full of nice rods and reels and lures and the best of everything he was a tournament fisherman and he'd take me out fishing. He'd be up there in the front of the boat just catching fish. And I'd be back there hanging up and doing everything else. And he'd feel sorry for me. He'd pull that boat up and he'd say, see them little bushes right over there? He said, you see how they, you got some that's got, they come out kind of like a V. You see that one out here on the end? He said, I want you to take this and I want you to throw that bait over there just as close to that one bush right there as you can. <clears throat> I didn't know nothing about it, but he did. I'm telling you, just let Jesus make you a fisher of men. I have often thought, Lord, how do... How do I help people relate to that? Fishers of men. Well, I want us to think about that analogy for a little bit. Remember that these guys that Jesus called were commercial fishermen. A boatload of fish was the most valuable commodity that they could think about. It's how they made their living. It was their highest goal every day. I believe that God really wants to teach us what's valuable. What's really valuable? And he said, as far as God is concerned, there's nothing any more valuable than a soul. For what shall it profit a man if he would gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Proverbs 11.30 says, this, this ought to be good for all of us encouragement. He that winneth souls is wise. God wants to teach us to value the things that he values. So I want to encourage you to purpose to learn to be effective. Purpose that you will bear much fruit. Jesus said, if we'll just abide in him and him and us, we'll bear much fruit. Here's something, here's something I want us to get to. You can think about this in natural terms for a minute. People are really good at doing something that they like to do. I don't care. I don't care if it's mowing, the, mowing grass. Y'all know I'm a little particular. I knew I'd get a reaction from somebody out of that. But I like to see these guys that do this professional lawn care, if they take their pains and when they get done, it just looks like it's a carpet out there. Man, the lines are straight. Every once in a while, somebody will do one of those and then they'll do it this way and it kind of looks like a, almost looks like a quilt laying there. 
you, you can bet one thing. That guy ain't just sweating to make a dollar. He's taking pride in what he's doing. He enjoys what he's doing. He likes what he's doing. Something that's undeniable is that people excel in doing what they love. People do well at things that they give themselves to. Now, having said that, I want you to hear this. The church just, the modern day church. All right, let's bring it on home closer than that. Let's say not just the church, not just the modern day church. Let's bring it on home to Valley Harvest Ministries. Her name is Valley Harvest Ministries. But if we'll be real, real this morning, as a church, we have to own the fact we just haven't really gotten into winning souls like we need to. We just haven't gotten into it. We haven't put our all into it. Sometimes we give some good lip service to it. We ain't put enough shoe leather in it. Now, may the Holy Spirit affirm what I said to you is true. Because I know we, we all want to wanna say, ooh, I'd rather not hear that. Pastor, how you know? That's not fair for you to say something like that. You decide if the Lord is saying that's right or not. We have not gotten in to winning souls. So I'm about to give you right now the greatest reason for you and you and you and you and you and you to become an effective witness and a soul winner for Jesus. Here it is. Because it is our greatest desire to obey Christ's command and to please the Father God. Right there should be the greatest motives we have in this life. Number one, to obey Christ's command. The last instruction he gave to his church was to go with this message. It was not a suggestion. It was an assignment. Now, Jesus gives a lot of parables and a lot of stories in the Bible to show us how this thing is going to be at one day. But, but one day, we're going to be accountable for how we have responded to his assignment. It's going to be acknowledged if we did or did not complete the assignment. It's going to be acknowledged if we put our hearts in it or if we just sort of, you know. It's going to be acknowledged if we did our best. So the first motive is to obey Christ's command. The second one, to please the Heavenly Father. The Bible teaches us that everything in this life, everything in this life, I don't know about you, but this sort of helps keep me straight. The realization that one day we're going to give an account for every action, for every attitude, for every word without exception. The highest motive that you and I should have today is that one day when we stand before God, more than anything else that we would want to hear would be, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. I want to hear that one day. Okay. I believe that I have shared what 
God has given me, and I believe you have received it, but there's, there's one more thing we've got to do before we quit today. We've got to talk about how we're going to apply this message. I, I, I want you right now to answer this question for yourself, between you and God. What are you going to do with this message? Or, you know, some options are, and I get, you know, as pastor, I'm well aware this goes on. Some people will critique it for content. Well, what do you think about it? Well, I think he could have, you know, I think he drove his point home too much. Or I think he should have said this. It ain't hardly a Sunday goes by that somebody don't tell me, Pastor, you left this, you left this out. What about this verse, Pastor? Well, you can't, you know, I can't preach it all in one Sunday. I'd like to, but I can't. So, are you going to critique it for? Are you going to maybe maybe something you're going might be tempted to do is to analyze this message for a contemporary significance? I mean, you know, these were fishermen. How's that apply to today? You, you you might be trying to analyze that. Here's something I think sometimes church people do. They'll file a message for future application. Oh, I, you know, I think it was King Agrippa said, you've almost got me persuaded. I, I, I'll, I'll deal with you about that at a later date. No, God has us dealing with this today. By God's grace and help, I believe this is what I am sent here to bring to Valley Harvest today, we've got to do something much more fitting. As a matter of fact, we got to do something more fitting than even praying about it. I'm not going to ask you to pray about this message because, you know, there, you don't have to ask God whether or not this is something we need to do or not. He done already commanded us to do it. What you, what you want to pray about is, how am, I, how am I going to do it? You see, we need to do something to bring about a change. We need to get out of the park gear and get this thing in drive. And so I'm going to bring you what I believe God has given me this week as vision for the next couple of months for this church. And I'm going to ask you, and I'm, going to ask, I'm praying that God, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be real honest with you. I know that I can't convince you to do anything. Because you've got a will. And sometimes, the more you think somebody's trying to convince you of something, the more you dig in not to do it. Or to be hard to do. So I'm not trying to convince. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is convincing us all today. I'm praying that you'll buy the vision of the church, that you'll give yourself to it, and with God's help, we're going to make the month of October a soul-winning, kingdom-expanding month. Now, we've got to do something different from what we've been doing. Y'all know that. We know that's, that's, that's what needs to happen. And we can say, God, make it happen. But we've got to do something different from what we've been doing. Because we are his witnesses. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to commit with God's help for everyone to reach out to people around you. And invite them to church. We're going to provide you with some structure. We're going to provide you with some leadership. We're going to provide you with some encouragement. But it's going to take us all. Because we are the body of Christ. And members in particular. Some of you have probably heard of this before. It's been done in other churches. Have you ever heard of frangelism? Everybody knows what evangelism is. That's reaching the lost, but have you heard of 
Frangelism. It's a play on an acronym of the first few letters. F-R-A-N. Friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Here's what we're going to do starting the second week of October. It's October the 8th. There's four weeks left in October, starting on October the 8th. We're going to focus on asking our unchurched friends to meet us here for church on Sunday. Pay particular attention to what I said. Our unchurched friends. We're not trying to empty any other church around here. We're not trying to compete with any other church. We're not trying to drag anybody off from any other church. If, you know, if it's somebody, you got a friend and you know they're a good Christian, don't just say, hey, would you come to church with me on Sunday? No. I want you to invite somebody that from all indication you have, you don't think they probably go to church, may not even be Christian, and I don't care how rough and tough they are. The first week is going to be for friends. The second week, we're going to invite our unchurched relatives. Y'all got some people in your family that ain't saved that you're concerned about them making it to heaven? That you know they need to be loved on and encouraged and preached to and prayed for? Relatives, the second week. The third week, we're going to invite associates, unchurched ones. The fourth week, neighbors. You got people who live around you, you'll never see them go to church. You'll never say nothing about church. As far as you know, they sleeping in on Sunday morning. Invite them to church. I'm going to promise you that every week, I'm going to have some fitting recognition, recognition for them. That will not embarrass them, but will make them feel welcome and appreciated for coming. We're going to ask you to help us with this. But we're going to purpose that we'll follow up with them. If you get them here, we're not going to call them like a vacuum cleaner salesman. But we will call them up and say, hey, this is one of the pastors from Valley Harvest. We noticed you were in church on Sunday. We want you to know it was special to us that you came. And, you know, you, you came with your friend so-and-so. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope you found it, I hope you found it, you know, encouraging. Is there anything else we can do for you today? We're just going to show them that we value them. But as we wind up today... I want to remind you, we have a commandment. We have an assignment. I hope you realize that even the greatest pastors and evangelists, hey, if I could have already gotten all the lost people in the New River, really Valley, New River Valley saved, I would have. I can't do it by myself. Pastor Perry, Pastor Derek, Pastor Walter, we can't do it all by ourselves. It's The assignment is for the body of Christ to be real people and just to take this love of Jesus and this message of the gospel to the world. You know what? As easy as this is, if we'll all Ask God and embrace this vision. There won't be an empty... We'll, by November, we could go to two services on Sunday morning. Some of you might say, Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, grow up. This ain't... This ain't a... This ain't a some kind of club we got here. We're trying to get people to heaven. Amen? Stand to your feet with me.
Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, as we stand here today, I believe that we're probably feeling some of the stuff that old Peter and James and John probably felt. We know we've heard from you, Lord, but we might be saying, what? We're asking ourselves just how, how to walk this out. But Lord, we're reminded, you told the fishermen, that you'd make them fishers of men. And we're asking you to make us fishers of men. Lord, when it comes to the vision that's been cast, your word says, write the vision, make it plain. Write it on table so that they that read it can run with it. Lord, I think you've made it pretty simple today. I don't think there's any reason why we, we could not run with this today. What is needed right now is for us to say yes to you. And to say, God, with your help, with your help, we will step into our ministry today. Today will mark a day that we took a maturing step from being just a believer to a disciple. To begin to take the steps to truly follow the Master. To truly serve the master. Lord, help us today. Help us today, Lord. I, I realize how sobering your call is. I realize how the flesh wants to draw back. Lord, help us just to feel the affirming, comforting, guiding presence of the Holy Spirit to give us the confidence to say, yes, by God's help, We'll do this. We'll do this. Help us, Lord. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Um, I said I was going to provide leadership and structure. So right now what I'm trying to do is help us get out of neutral. Take the first step of faith. If you feel like you heard God today in what's been said, if you can see the vision, and with God's help, if you will be a part of this effort in the month of October, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up right now. Thank you. Before God. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, you see our hands today. Our hands going up, Lord, are like them boys coming out of that boat and leaving the net behind. We're stepping out by faith today to say, Lord, we're going into the field. We're going to have an open eye and an open ear both to the need and to your prompting. 
And we're going to share the goodness of our God with this lost and dying world. Anoint us today, God. We receive it today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We give you praise, Lord. Amen. Guys, it's been awesome being with you today. I believe God has spoken to our hearts today. Been a been an unusual day. I know. As you bring as you bring your uh friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors to church, I won't be doing so much vision casting as today. I'll be preaching the word, okay? I'll be I'll be gearing the messages with God's help to things that will minister to them specifically. This is, this is the family of God here today. But on those days, we're going to be more aware that we're, we're doing more of a, uh, an outreach type message. God bless you. Love you. Have a good day. We'll see you Wednesday.